Hi everybody, uh, this lecture focuses on the relationship between ethics and technical writing. Of course, last week we talked about uh, rhetorical situations and the connections between rhetoric and technical writing. Ethos, of course, is part of that rhetorical triangle. Ethos referring to the character uh, or credibility, trustworthiness, all these, these ideas of character that relate to the to the writer in the situation okay so we're really talking about what is the position of the technical writer or some considerations we should think of um, through the lens of ethics when we think about what it means to write uh, and communicate in the workplace so first of all really quickly what is ethics uh, ethics at its simplest is a system of moral principles. It affects how people make decisions and lead their lives. Ethics is concerned with what is good for individuals and society and is also described as moral philosophy. So certainly uh, you've heard of uh, people being ethical or unethical. Uh, and that idea is, is what they're doing right or wrong in relation to what is good for society or good, good for a group of individuals. Now, it's clear that ethics can be different um, in different contexts. That is, certain things are permissible in some contexts where they're not permissible in others. But generally speaking, if we're thinking about workplace uh, ethics, we're thinking about what is good for both the organization in which we're working, what is good for us, what is good for our clients and users of our documents, uh, but also what is the public good and so we're trying to make the best decision to act ethically within a fairly complex uh, context right uh, if we only act in self-interest uh, we can uh, will typically be considered to be unethical if our self-interest differs from or pulls us away from what is good for larger groups right for the organization or for society if we only emphasize organizational culture and what is ethical within that organization, we run the risk of losing our personal ethics and or once again violating the ethics of the society in which we live. Right. So uh, we have to work to make sure we balance and understand those contexts so we can act as ethically as possible in the way that is going to be most uh, fair and right and good for our society uh, and the users of our documents. So workplace ethics and ethical communication. Ethical behavior, including ethical communication, um, involves not just telling the truth and providing accurate information, but telling the truth and providing information so that, it, so that a reasonable audience knows the truth. In other words, it is not our duty just to make sure that our documents are accurate and truthful, but that they also uh, explain that information in a way that the audience can use and understand it, right? Um, it also means that you act to prevent actual harm with set criteria for what kinds and degrees of harm are more serious than others. For example, someone's life might outweigh your financial damage to your company, right? Your company's success outweighs your own irritation. We can think about different degrees of what is ethical and unethical. Uh, but the idea is, of course, that we recognize that there are more serious uh, considerations than others. Right? So uh, saving someone's life is clearly more important than my own irritation, right? Um, so as a guideline, ask yourself what would happen if your action or non-action or inaction became public? If you would go to prison, lose your friends, lose your job, or even just feel really embarrassed, uh, the action is probably unethical, right? So we're thinking about ethics as something that reflects back on us uh, and by extension reflects back on our workplace because we're a member of that workplace. So is that reflection something that is going to harm us or not? Well, that means that we would lose character or credibility that affects our ethos, our ethics. Um, so ethical principles for technical communicators. 
The Society for Technical Communication adopted these ethical principles in September of 1998. As technical communicators, we observe the following ethical principles in our professional activities. And you can look at their specific definitions for each of these terms, but I think the terms in and of themselves uh, speak volumes. So, uh, legality. Every document we produce should be legal. That is, it should communicate uh, information in a legal way and in a legal manner. All right. Every document we should we pr produce should be honest. Right. Should, honesty should be a core of what we do. Uh, true and accurate information. Right. Um, our documents should respect common confidentiality. Right. Uh, what information are we sharing and to whom are we sharing it and do we have the authorization, the right uh, to share that information with the audience uh, to whom we are, are writing in our documents. Um, in the same way that, that information doesn't necessarily have to be personal information, right? A lot of times in healthcare we think about confidentiality and communication uh, and in education we think about confidentiality and communication because we're talking about vulnerable populations, patients and students who are protected uh, not only ethically but also legally um, from the sharing of their information, uh, confidentiality. But really as members of an organization we have, uh, we have the duty to protect uh, confidential information that might reflect badly on the company or might be uh, something like a trade secret that would hurt, harm the company in some way. So these are all ethical considerations. Quality, that the work we produce is of good quality, right? We're, we're not just throwing things out there uh, and hoping they stick. Instead, uh, we treat uh, technical documents as something deserving of effort and time, and we develop them in a way that their quality matches the importance uh, significance of the information and message they can convey. Fairness. Uh, we as technical communicators uh, trying to be ethical want to treat all information and argumentation and messaging fairly. Our job is not to present the information from a particular bias or a particular standpoint, viewpoint, but instead is to uh, provide the information our user needs to make an ethical decision, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, and finally, professionalism. It is an ethical duty for us to write and act professionally in the workplace. If you want to check this out, check out the website for the Society for Technical Communication. There it is. Um, so, you're going to get tired of this, I think, but we want to remember we're, we're working through the problem-solving approach. So here we're talking about ethical considerations in the problem-solving approach. So we're going to look again at plan, research, draft, review, and distribute. So here are some questions for understanding an ethical situation. In other words, so before we looked at the rhetorical situation, right, um, and the problem-solving approach, now we're going to look at uh, how ethics might influence that same kind of work. So what is my reason for writing this document? Who is affected by this information and this document, right? So this moves us beyond just the simple consideration of audience awareness and asks us to think ethically, uh, can this information harm anybody? Um, and if so, who will be harmed? Um, <clears throat> of course, we could also be doing positive things with our document, right? But we were, as, as ethical people, want to be really concerned with trying not to harm others, right? What authority do I have in conveying this information? Is my authority going to put me in a position where I have power over other people and they're gonna believe what I, what I write or what I say just because I am who I am? If so, I need to be aware of that and, and find ways to temper that expectation, right? We don't wanna abuse that authority uh, to convey a message that ultimately should lead to a decision by the audience, not just following by the audience. What are the ramifications for conveying this information in this document, right? Is, is this information significant in some way? Uh, does the way we present it uh, need to be different uh, because of the kind of information it is? 
What response is this document and your choices as a writer likely to invoke? Right, what, uh, is there any backlash we can anticipate? Uh, people who will disagree with what we're doing? Um, if, we can, if we can anticipate that, then we can revise in ways that will allow us to avoid those kinds of responses, right? Uh, and then finally, how does this document represent me and the organization to the user and the general public, right? So if this document is made public, what are people going to think about me as its writer and the organization as, the, as my employer? When we think about research, we want to remember to research thoroughly to better understand the issue and avoid potential bias. Uh, it's really easy just to find a source that might agree with what we want to say and just stop there. We want to make sure that we uh, take a broad look at the issue, particularly for larger documents um, that will require us to do a lot of research to really understand the issue and some potential solutions, right? So um, be always err on the th side of being a bit too thorough, right? Carefully evaluate sources and accuracy of all research and use research to confirm the accuracy of information. In other words, make sure you're getting good information from reliable resources. And if you have some information of your own that you believe to be true, make sure you can confirm that through additional research. Respect confidentiality when sharing information and ensure informed consent. Informed consent is a way in which we can get permission uh, to both collect data and to use that data in different ways without violating the rights of people um, who provide that information, right? So if we do some kind of uh, user study or user test, we want to convey that information to a different audience, we need to make sure they understand that the information we're collecting can and will be used in a variety of ways, right? Including the sharing of that information. If you're interested in doing research with um, human subjects at some point in your research career, perhaps for your thesis, then you will certainly need to uh, research more what it means to get informed consent when working with uh, humans as research subjects. And this, this should seem obvious, uh, but let's make it clear, do not falsify data, trim data, or cherry pick data to support your purpose, right? So falsify is just don't make it up, right? trim, uh, don't uh, cut out the results that aren't useful to you, right? and cherry pick, don't just pick a couple of examples that prove your point, uh, particularly if the rest of the data does not hold up to the same uh, results that you would like to have. Drafting. We think about how a writer presents information in a document and how that can affect a reader's understanding of the relative weight or seriousness of that information. So carefully organize and arrange information for appropriate and ethical emphasis on the most important information. Don't hide really important information in the middle of a paragraph. Don't create uh, bubble outs with really unimportant information that might make people think it's important information. Uh, think about how the way we arrange and organize our information does create a sense of emphasis for the reader and says, these are the most important things. Okay, things like headings, um, things that get uh, graphs and charts and illustrations of different kinds, right? Which leads to the next point, use visual information like graphics ethically. Um, be careful when you're creating, and we'll talk about this more when we talk about visuals, but be careful when creating charts because we don't want a chart that uh, leads to misinterpretation of the data, okay? Uh, do not overemphasize or suppress information. Give audiences all the information necessary for them to make informed decisions. And this is something we see a lot when we uh, look at inexperienced writers who are trying to make an argument. They tend to pick out uh, a number of sources that support their position and maybe just one that they argue against. Uh, and in doing so, it makes it seem like, well, everybody agrees with that person except for this one outlier. Uh, and it's, it's not an ethical choice but if it's not true, right? So um, make sure that when you do your research, you get all the research you need on various uh, perspectives on the issue, and then you share that in a fair and balanced way with the audience. Um, finally, identify sources that inform your document. Presenting others' work without acknowledgement is unethical and amounts to stealing, right? And you've all heard the word plagiarism before, 
but really, in this case, we're not always just talking about plagiarism where we're actually stealing something, but also making sure that people who want to use your document, particularly longer documents that include a lot of research, can consult that original research on their own um, if they want to research the issue further. Review. Remember that even the slightest change to a document can change or obscure the information being conveyed. So be clear in your goals and make sure all parties understand the extent of the revisions being made. Now, oftentimes you'll be working in a team as a technical writer and it will come back to you uh, some form of the document and your final job is to edit that down and make it as perfect as possible. Uh, but just because that is your primary responsibility in this task doesn't mean you get to do it on your own and without advising others in the group, right? So uh, because something as simple as changing one word can change the tone and the meaning of the message. Be aware of your own and your organization's biases. Uh, just because you believe something to be true doesn't make it true. Um, and we tend to believe sources and research that support our positions already. So we have to be as open-minded as possible, even within our own organizations, not get caught up in organizational culture and our own personal biases. One way to work on that is not to be afraid to engage outsiders for feedback. So who can we look to outside of our organization, people who are maybe different from us, uh, people who are potential users to get feedback? before we send it out to the general public. And of course, edit carefully. As you think about distribution, um, and this keys in with our first lecture this week, uh, think about how easy it is nowadays to um, participate in what we might call soundbite culture. And that is either taking a really complex idea and simple, oversimplifying it, um, or even just taking a message pulling one fragment out of it uh, and reproducing it on its own without context. So because technology allows for easy and rapid circulation, consider both your own accountability and what others can do with your documentation. So how can you think about the way you're distributing and publishing your information uh, and how you can maybe reduce the possibility for it to be misused? Some key ways you want to think about that email anything you send that's digital uh, things like email um, are then easily forwarded on or replied and cc'd to other people copied or blind copied to other people so make sure that what is in your email uh, to the best of your ability is representative of you and your workplace ethics at all times Avoid, for example, in a workplace sending informal emails. If you have informal communication, use your non-work email. And that way you're protecting yourself and your employer from backlash if that email is misused um, or used out of context, right? Um, this is similar to social media, right? You should have a clear division between your professional social media and your personal social media. Uh, and that allows us to be different personalities in different places because social media is something, once again, that is easily shared, right? All somebody has to do is like it and it starts appearing on their friends' news feeds or retweet it or share it. And it's available to, uh, to audiences that perhaps were not our intended audiences. So we want to make sure we're aware of that as we're making choices about what we do in the workplace and out of the workplace and how those different contexts can influence one another. Uh, and I think this ties very clearly to what we call soundbite culture. And that is that notion that um, people have become used to, to getting information in small pieces and they want a simplified kind of tagline or hashtag for whatever message you're trying to send, right? So um, oftentimes we can have complex documents that then are reduced to one statement in that document. So we want to make sure that our one statement um, is something that we've chosen for it to be, right? So something we might put as a header to a document that that's basically stands there and says, if you want to know exactly what this document is for, here it is. So nobody else is doing that work of reducing our document for us. Um, 
And likewise, how can we make it more difficult for people to take sound bites out of context and use them to reflect negatively upon us? A few specific things you can think about as a writer um, to be a bit more ethical in your writing are to use clear, precise, and concise language. So clear, make sure uh, that the word says what we want it to say. Precise, make sure it is exactly the word we want to say. And concise, we're getting to the point with the simplest language possible. So we want to do things like avoid ambiguous subjects. When we say some users experience this or few people do that. Uh, what we're doing is we're, we're using undefined terms as the subjects of our sentences and it's not really an honest and fair way to communicate information, right? If we know exactly how many people are impacted by it, we should share that information. We want to avoid the passive voice in technical writing. And passive voice is of course when the object is doing the action uh, rather than the subject doing the action in a sentence. So, typical sentence for that, the boy hit the ball, that's active voice, right? The boy is our subject that does the action of hitting the object, the ball. Uh, in passive voice, we would say something like, the ball was hit by the boy. Uh, and in that construction, of course, we can still make out who is the, the subject and the object who actually did the action. Right? It's not as complex as some sentences. But passive voice can sometimes be used to obscure uh, who is responsible for an action. So, Africans were enslaved. In that case, something you might read in a history book, um, it appears that Africans were enslaved by nobody. Right? We don't have uh, a subject there. And it allows us to obscure that information in a way that puts the focus on the enslavement of Africans and not who is responsible for enslaving them. Uh, and so we want to be careful because it allows, um, it allows technical writers who are unethical to hide responsibility. Um, so as ethical actors and ethical writers, we want to make sure that uh, we are, our nouns, our subjects, and our verbs are explicit and clearly connected so the reader can follow exactly what happened and have all the information. Uh, similarly, we want to avoid abstract nouns, ideas without definition, like freedom or truth or honesty. Um, and then when we use them, we need to define them, right? So when I shared those, some of those ideas earlier in this presentation, I would make sure to define what that means in relationship to our specific context in technical writing. Same thing you want to do there. Uh, make sure that we define anything that's abstract in our writing. Avoid jargon or specialized language, uh, particularly when you're writing for an audience that is not necessarily familiar with that jargon. Use commonly confused words carefully. If you know you have problems with a particular set of commonly confused words like effect and affect, uh, make sure that you take the time uh, to learn that difference, right? Uh, it's a good good habit to keep a list of your common problems, whatever they are, um, and double check them in your own writing before moving forward, or rewrite to avoid them altogether. Uh, you use contextually acceptable inclusive language. So avoid sexist or biased language. Not all biased language is sexist, right? Um, but saying things like, uh, she was a lady doctor, right, and that lady there, um, it, that's a, an example of sexist language. I know some of you think, well, who would write that? You, you might know people who would say or write that, right? Um, and if not, then you're doing great, right? Uh, but be careful about using uh, only gendered uh, language when gender isn't required for the sentence to make sense or to apply to the situation. Avoid using uh, stereotypical terms when, when you're talking about other people. Good practice is to call people what they want to be called. And there's uh, an ever-growing list of, uh, of, of appropriate and contemporary terms for different groups of people and individuals. And so uh, when part of our research when we're doing work for a document is to make sure that the people that we're talking about uh, we can clearly define who they are and use the appropriate terminology to describe them. 
Avoid dialect, regional, and non-standard language in technical writing. Avoid slang and other informal language. And on the other side of that, avoid indirect, pretentious, and wordy writing. Right? Don't go over the top being fancy in your writing. Uh, use the simplest, uh, most neutral terms we can to express what we want to express in a way the audience will understand it most clearly. Now, does that mean no technical writing includes non-standard or regional or slang? Well, of course not, right? Uh, and that's why we want to think about context. So what's contextually acceptable in our situation? Finally, use appropriate and correct grammar. Punctuate correctly and for effect. Think about how our grammar uh, is something we use to emphasize ideas and to uh, demarcate different ideas. Be aware of parallel and complete structures, right? That, that when we're writing complete sentences, they are sentences. When we're making lists of things, particularly like we do in technical writing a lot with bullet points, that they are in the same structure. So they are parallel to one another. And we'll talk more about each of these uh, specific writing issues as we move through the course, and we'll be practicing a lot of them. But this is just to get you thinking about how even word choice uh, and language choice can be connected to something as big as ethics. All right. Well, uh, thanks. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'm always here to help.